Здравствуйте, уважаемые коллеги. Сегодня у нас очередное заседание нашего клуба «Спот». И тема сегодняшнего заседания – это опухоли беспервично выявленного очага. Профессор Павлидис прочитает для нас лекцию. Пока мы его ждем, коллеги, какие у вас есть по этому вопросу предложение, кроме как включить микрофон? Не, на самом деле важно сказать, да, что опухоль изневельно первичного очага – это крайне редкая патология, которая встречается менее чем в 5% случаев, и диагностика затруднена. Хотелось бы напомнить коллегам, да, что опухоль изневельно первичного очага – это та опухоль, при которой были, выявлены, были проведены все диагностически необходимые процедуры, но при этом а, не выявлен первичный очаг. То есть данная опухоль… Метастатический процесс есть, все необходимые диагностические процедуры мы сделали, но мы по-прежнему не знаем, откуда идет первичный очаг. Я думаю, Юрий Игоревич, как и у вас, это не часто встречалось в вашей каждодневной практике клинической. У меня другой вопрос. Давайте. Что делать э, с переводом сегодняшней трансляции? Коллеги, да, важно заметить, что сегодняшняя трансляция будет идти на английском языке. Как мы и говорили, спот становится международным. Сегодняшняя трансляция будет на английском языке. Если у вас есть вопросы, вы можете задавать их в нашем чате YouTube. Мы будем переводить их для профессора. Если профессор успеет ответить на вопрос, он ответит онлайн, либо мы потом продублируем в письме. Кроме этого, вы можете задать вопросы и на английском. Это Пос... будет Это замечательно. Тоже будет замечать, потому что, конечно же, мы понимаем, что уровень английского порой позволяет понимать, но не позволяет говорить. Поэтому... Единственное, что мы не будем сегодня выводить в эфир специалистов из других центров. Да, У нас трансляция идет раз, да. на нашей платформе и на... Платформе Европейской школы онкологии. Да, и на YouTube-канале да. НИИ онкологии Петрова. Поэтому вы можете свои вопросы задавать через все источники. А, пока, мы, да, пока мы ждем начала трансляции, а, пожалуйста, можете задать вопросы в чате на YouTube. Uh -huh. Мы постараемся на них ответить в силу своих компетенций. Также напоминаем о том, что наши заседания проходят еженедельно. А, уже запланировано мероприятие на следующую неделю. На следующей неделе у нас будет вебинар. А 16 апреля у нас будет подключение из регионов. Из, э, наш специалист, э, представитель СПОД э, Артем Зандарян прочтет нам клинический случай по метастатическому раку молочной железы, эстроген позитивному, вместе, естественно, с обзором, э, из с, да, из с, вместе с обзором проблемы, которые представит наш специалист Татьяна Юрьевна Семиглазова. Да, и пользуясь случаем, конечно, мы приглашаем молодых специалистов к сотрудничеству. Если вы хотите стать кураторами спот в своем регионе, либо в своей больнице или центре, вы можете прислать заявку на наш электронный адрес, и, соответственно, мы с вами свяжемся и подключим к нашим мероприятиям. Итак, мероприятие у нас уже сегодняшнее практически Начинается, началось. Да. Единственное, последнюю ремарку хочется сказать, что 30 апреля будет следующее заседание ССПОД, и оно пройдет по теме лимфома Ходжкина. Лучшее по материалам ЭШ. Поэтому присоединяйтесь, 30 апреля будет очередной ССПОД. Начинаем, коллеги. Спасибо. Да. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, my name is Nicholas Pavlidis, and what I've tried to do for the next uh, 30 minutes is to cover the diagnostic and therapeutic uh, issues of uh, cancer of a non-primary. Before I start, I would like first to thank uh, Francesca Marangoni from the ESO office, and also Dr. Eli Rassi from Gustave Roussy, who is going to help me in collecting questions. So let's start by giving you the first slide. It doesn't move. All right. 
So, as I said before, the whole issue will be covered by trying to answer to a number of questions. So the first question is, what is the incidence of uh, cancer of a non-primary site? Uh, people believe that the cancer of a non-primary is a really rare disease, but it is obvious that CAP accounts for 3 to 5% of all human cancers. In other words, it is considered to be the eighth most frequent malignant tumor. However, during the last two decades, both from Europe and in the United States, we have evidence that the incidence is decreasing. The question here is why is it decreasing? How can we explain that? So there are a few uh, explanations regarding the decreased incidence of CAP, and this is, first of all, improved diagnostics. We have better immunohistochemistry, we have molecular gene expression profiling, we have better imaging technology, which might uh, be able to detect the primary site. On the other hand, we have better smoking control, especially in the United States. You should know that uh, one of the risk factors for CAP is smoking. Almost 3.66 is the relative risk for current smokers, and for heavy smokers could go up to 5.1 as a relative risk, of course. So the second question I'm trying to elaborate is uh, what is the clinical presentation of patients with CAP? This is a classical man with uh, middle age and supraclavicular lymphadenopathy on the left side. This is a lady with subcutaneous nodules. This is a man with huge liver, full of metastatic sites in the uh, CT. And also, this is a patient with bilateral lying metastasis. However, no primary tumor would ever be able to find. So, the next question is, is there any specific natural history of these patients? The fundamental characteristics are those of having an early dissemination, a clinical absence of the primary site at presentation, to be most of the times aggressive tumors, and some of them to have an unpredictable metastatic pattern. Next question is, is cancer of a non-primary site one or more than one diseases? If you look at uh, the histological classification, almost 85% of these patients have an adenocarcinoma, 10% a squamous cell carcinoma, and the rest have undifferentiated neoplasms, which means non-specified carcinoma, neuroendocrine tumors, lymphoma, germ cell, melanomas, etc. And this is one of the most important slides, if you want to keep attention to that. This is the slide referring to the clinical pathological entities of these patients, which means that you have several groups in CAP. For example, we have patients with only or mainly liver metastasis, you might have patients with lymph node metastasis only, like metastasis in the mediastinal or the retroperitoneal region, only into the axillary lymph, lymph nodes, to the cervical lymph nodes, or to the inguinal lymph nodes. But also we have patients with peritoneal disease, either the peritoneal adenocarcinomatosis in females, which have uh, histology compatible with papillary or serous adenocarcinoma, and you understand this looks like an ovarian cancer, but also we have malignant ascites of other origins, which are not papillary or serous adenocarcinoma. Also, we have uh, uh, patients with only lung disease, such as pulmonary metastasis, or only pleural effusion, but also we have patients with one or more than one bone metastasis, 
one or more than one brain metastasis. We do have the neuroendocrine tumors, and also we might have melanoma of a known primary. I would like to stop here. This is the first part of my talk. If there are questions, I'll be happy to answer. Ellie, do you have any questions? No, not yet, Dr. Cobbledis. If there are no questions, then I, I go ahead with the second part, is how we have to investigate our patients in order to detect the primary site. So the first thing is to do good histopathology with extensive immunohistochemistry and sometimes advanced molecular technology. The second is to have imaging technology with us, having conventional radiology, ultrasound, CT scans, MRIs, mammography, or sometimes PET scans. And also we have endoscopy. You can do any kind of endoscopy from ENT pan endoscopy, bronchoscopy, colonoscopy, proctoscopy, or colposcopy. So this is the algorithm for someone who wants to investigate a patient with a cancer of a known primary. Let's uh, focus on the histopathology. I would like to save time at least to describe a slide on cytokeratins, which is again a nice algorithm for all medical oncologists, especially on the CK7 and CK20. If you have a patient who has CK7 positive and CK20 positive, then probably you are dealing with a urothelial tumor, an ovarian adenocarcinoma, a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, or a hollandia carcinoma. However, if you have a patient with CK7 positive and CK20 negative, then probably your patient might have a hidden lung, breast, thyroid, endometrial, cervical, salivary gland, hollandia carcinoma, or pancreatic carcinoma. But if your patient has CK7 negative and CK20 positive, then probably he has either colorectal cancer or Merkel cell carcinoma. And the last uh, category is the one with CK7 negative and CK20 negative. Those patients might have a hidden liver, renal, prostate, squamous cell, or head neck uh, carcinoma. What about the molecular analysis? Very useful, up to 80 or 90 percent accuracy. You might detect uh, the primary tumor by doing just uh, profiling molecular analysis. And these are the several assays available in the market. And uh, I'm not going to stick on that now because I'll come back later on on the uh, gene profiling expression. Also, you might go to liquid biopsy, which is not yet uh, uh, established, but that is very, uh, we have enthusiastic people in favor of liquid biopsy, and probably someday we'll have that, this diagnosis as uh, an easy tool to detect the primary side. And let's discuss a little bit about endoscopy. Keep in mind that endoscopy should always be done only if you have symptoms or relevant signs in order to try to uh, investigate the primary site. For example, if you have a patient with cervical node, it would be nice to have an ENT pan endoscopy. If you have someone with lung lesions or cough or hemoptysis, bronchoscopy will be useful. If you have someone with relevant symptoms and signs from colon, then colonoscopy will be helpful. The same thing for proctoscopy and the same thing for col colposcopy. What I'm trying to say is that it's not useful to have the patient in your department and try to, uh, try to have endoscopies everywhere from the top to the bottom in order to detect the primary site just order an endoscopy only 
if you have relevant symptoms or signs. What about imaging studies? Chest X-ray is all right. Barium studies, forget about that. CT scans can help you up to 40%, and also they can help you to get a biopsy. Mammography, unfortunately, has, has low sensitivity, but MRI of the breast can give you an accuracy of 60%. And PET scan is useful not all the time, but in something like 40%, and it is more sensitive to detect head and neck tumors. What about serum tumor markers? If you do it routinely, there are no today any evidence that we have any proven prognostic preventive, uh, sorry, prognostic predictive or diagnostic assistance. However, sometimes you might ask for a PSA, for example, in men with bone metastasis without primary sign, beta ACG and AFP in men with undifferentiated tumors, AFP in patients with liver tumors, CA125 in women with papillary adenocarcinoma of peritoneal cavity, and the CA153 in women with adenocarcinoma involving the auxiliary nodes. So here again, I can stop if there are some questions. Dr. Pavlid, there's no questions yet, but I have a question of my own, if you may. Go ahead. So it's not just for us to have patients with liver mass undifferentiated tumors. It's a common presentation that we see in our practice. And upon uh, the biopsy, we have, let's say, CK7 negative, CK20 negative. And the pathologist might say, it may be renal cell carcinoma, I don't know. And upon scan imaging, it's not really clear whether there's something that might be a primary on the scan. And the treatments are really different between renal cell carcinoma and other treatments since renal cell carcinoma is resistant to chemotherapy. What would be your approach for such a patient? Well, this is, a, uh, this is a, 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 something that I would like to discuss it later on, but I can give you the, the answer very rapidly. This is the case, especially if you have a young patient to go for profiling gene expression, okay? Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't recommend gene profiling to every patient, but as I said, I'll come back to that quite, quite soon. Any other question? No, that's it, thank you. All right, so this is another important question. Do we have effective drugs for CAP patients, or do we just have responsive subsets? of CAP patients. This is a historical slide going back to 2003 when we, for the first time with our American friends, differentiated, distinguished CAP in two different groups, the good prognosis and the poor prognosis group. And if we want to start with the Poor prognosis, with the, sorry, the good prognosis, the favorable subsets, which unfortunately uh, is only 20% of all CAP patients. You see here that uh, women with adenocarcinoma involving only the axillary lymph nodes belongs to this category. Women with papillary adenocarcinoma of peritoneal cavity, squamous cell carcinoma involving cervical nodes, poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, men with plastic bone metastasis and elevated PSA, isolated inguinal adenopathy, and patients with a single, small, potentially resectable tumor. These belong traditionally to the favorable subsets, but later on I'll come to some new subsets which could belong to the favorable uh, group. So let's see one after the other. This is the first subset, women with occult primary breast carcinoma, which are presenting as axillary lymphadenopathy. So these are uh, women with mostly having biopsy ductal adenocarcinoma, which are 40% ERPR positive and 30% HER2 positive. 
in age 52, most of them were postmenopausal. You have to keep in mind that these patients should be managed as having a stage two breast cancer patient. Here, if you're trying to find metastasis, you'll get disappointed that less than 2% will have distant metastasis, and the five-year survival is quite good. It's similar to the breast cancer, is around 70%. And then we have the other subset, the subset of women with serous papillary peritoneal carcinoma, where we are dealing with women who have similar presentation like patients with advanced ovarian cancer, median age around 60. Histopathology, as I said before, should be always serous or papillary adenocarcinoma, and the serum CA125 is uh, frequently increased. These patients, again, should be treated at, as stage 3 to 4 ovarian cancer. The sponsor rate is similar, 80%, with complete responders 30 to 40%, and a median survival of around 36 months. The next subset is the squamous cell carcinoma of an unknown primary site involving the cervical lymph nodes, where we have uh, patients around 60 years old, median age. Investigational approach for the primary site uh, could be either bilateral tonsillectomy or tongue-based mucosectomy. However, these days we have a PET scan which can detect the primary site in almost 80% of the patients. What is the treatment for these patients? If you have a patient with N1 or N2A disease without any extracapsular extension, go for surgery alone. The local, the local regional control is good, and the five-year survival is around 65%. However, if you have patients with more than N2B stage or with extracapsular extension, then the uh, recommended treatment is postoperative chemoradiation. Keep in mind that this patient might be HPV positive, and uh, this is something which we described with Dr. Rassi recently. These patients, however, should be treated like we treat the rest of the head and neck cancers, and probably these patients still have a better prognosis. Uh, the other subset is the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, where uh, this is a review we've done several years ago with 500 patients. 60% of them were treated with platinum-based chemotherapy. Response rate was around 50 to 60%, with a complete response of 20-30%, and median survival 15.5 months, having some long-term survivals at the end of the day. This, this slide here shows you what we have today about newly identified favorable CAP subsets with uh, uh, proper immunohistochemistry or with molecular profiling. There are patients who look like a colon carcinoma who are CK20 positive, CK7 negative, and CDX2 positive. We have patients with Merkel cell carcinoma, renal cell carcinoma for non-primary, lung carcinoma for non-primary, and also metastatic melanoma for non-primary. So let's see one after the other. Adenocarcinoma with the column profile, again CK20 positive, CK7 negative, CDX2 positive, these patients should be treated as having patients with advanced colorectal cancer. The response rate is around 50%, with 50% uh, complete responders, and a median survival of 21 to 37 months. Then we have the renal cell carcinoma presenting as CAP. This is quite recent. We have some, several cases in the literature the last one or two years. Uh, I collected them for you. These are 52 patients uh, with a median age of 64. They have various histology from clear cell, 
to unspecified histology, but have a classical positive immunohistochemistry for renal cancer, as you can see on the slide, and these patients have been treated with DKIs or pemcirolins. The response rate was around 40 to 50 percent having PR, a mean PFS of 8.5 months, and a mean survival up to 16 months. Merkel cell carcinoma of annoying primary, which we know these days can be treated with a Velumab with a quite uh, good results, which was found in 2013 that at two years overall survival of patients with stage 3B unknown primary of Merkel cell carcinoma was significantly improved if we compare that with patients with the same stage of known Merkel cell disease. Also for metastatic melanoma, uh, this is one of our old study where we, con we selected, concentrated something like 4,000 patients from the literature. And you see here, if you have patients with a known melanoma, both 5 and 10 year survival are better than uh, patients with known melanoma. The same thing happened uh, quite recently. Uh, this is a systematic review with meta-analysis. Almost 2,000 patients with melanoma of unknown primary and almost 6,000 6, patients with melanoma of known primary. And the results were more or less the same like uh, our study. So these are all about the good prognosis, the favorable prognosis subsets of patients with carcinoma of a known primary. Now, if there are no questions, I can move to the poor prognosis. Ellie? Please go on. Shall I go on? Yes. Okay. So, uh, the sad news about these subsets, the subsets of poor prognosis patients, unfortunately, are the majority. 80% of all CAP cases belong to this prognosis. Now we have the uh, unfavorable subset. You can see what one after the other, metastatic carcinoma of the liver or other organs, non-papillary malignant ascites, multiple cerebral metastasis, multiple lung pleural metastasis, or multiple metastatic bone disease. If you put them all together and you get the uh, most uh, known studies in all over the world, you'll find out that the response rate is less than 20% and median survival, unfortunately, is around five months. This uh, registry patient comes from Ontario. It's quite useful and a very recent one. They, they selected uh, 45,000 patients with known metastatic disease and almost 1,700 uh, patients with CAP. So they found out that the median survival of patients with known primary treated versus untreated was 19 months versus 2.2 months. And the CAP for the known primary Treated versus untreated was only, unfortunately, 3.6 versus 1.1 months. So the overall median survival is going to look very awful. Known versus CAP is almost 12 months versus 2 months. So the, now the question here is, if we apply molecular genetic expression profiling to these patients, are we going to have better therapeutic results or not? This is the first paper published, which looks, uh, looks like a prospective trial. However, this patient, you have to keep in mind that it is just an observational study. It's not prospective, randomized study. The conclusion here is that the median survival was 12 point months for patients who received assay-directed site-specific therapy compares to patients who had a standard treatment, 
and empirical chemotherapy. This is uh, the curves. You can see the curves here, the median survival. And also the same results uh, we got from a paper in Lancet Oncology showing that the epigenetic profiling to classify cancer of a non-primary has exactly the same results, but still not a randomized So what do we expect nowadays in order to resolve the issue and to have a more safe answer to that is to, to, to get the results of two big studies which are ongoing. The first one is the Jeff Capi 04, uh, which is taking place in France, is a phase three study. The arms are number one, platinum-based chemo. This is the empirical chemotherapy versus uh, gene profiling uh, specific treatment. The second study, again, is a randomized study, phase two, the so-called Cupisco, where the randomized patients to get empirical treatment versus targeted treatment or immunotherapy with atezolizumab. However, during the last two weeks, we've had in the, liter in the literature something which is again uh, something new in our, in our era, and this is the randomized phase two study coming from Osaka, Japan. So what they have done, they have two groups again. The one group was treated with a site-specific treatment after the gene profiling test, and the other group had been treated with umbilical. And here we have the one-year uh, survival rate, and you'll see that PFS and overall survival and one-year survival is more or less the same. So there is no any difference in these two groups. Either you treat them according to the uh, profiling uh, gene expression test or if you go straight to empirical treatment. This is something new and we have to be a bit careful. But if you go to the NCCN and try to see what the NCCN clinical practice guideline says, look at that. Until more robust outcomes and comparative effectiveness data are available, the pathologists and we are, we the oncologists, must collaborate uh, in order to uh, examine each case, case by case, on, on a case by case basis with best possible individual patient outcome. And the last question is actually, do we have anything new regarding targeted treatment or immunotherapy? If you look at the literature, you'll find out that almost 85% of the patients uh, have clinically relevant mutations or targetable biomarkers, and they are, most of them currently, uh, could be currently be benefited by uh, targeted drugs or by immunotherapy. However, up to now, we have only anecdotal cases with TKIs, monoclonal antibodies, or immune checking point inhibitors, and we are expecting to have the results of both the JFKP-04 and Pupisco study. So, Let's now try to answer these three, three critical questions. Question number one is, does molecular profile assay increase the accuracy of identifying the primary site? Probably the answer here is yes. Question number two is, does molecular profiling help in utilizing targeted treatment? Yes and no. We are not certain yet. And the last question is, does the identification of a primary site improve patient outcome, improve survival? We really do not yet know. So having said that, I would like to end my talk by giving you, by giving you the 
uh, take home messages. If you have a patient with the diagnosis of the metastatic carcinoma, you have to go through three steps. Step number one is trying to search the primary site, either clinically or immunohistochemically, by imaging or by endoscopy studies. And then go to step two, where you have to rule out potentially treatable or curable tumors. No one wants to miss a breast cancer, a germ cell tumor, or a lymphoma. And then you go straight to the step three, where you have to characterize up to now without any gene profiling most of the times, where your, pa your patient belongs, in which specific clinical pathological entity your patient belongs, and treat your patients accordingly. So if patients belong to the good prognosis group, you should treat them similarly to relevant primaries with curative intent. But if you have a poor prognosis patient, you can treat them either with empirical chemotherapy or if you are quite rich and you can do the team profiling and use uh, uh, targeted treatment or immunotherapy without big evidence so far, you can do it. So having said that, I think uh, I covered the whole issue. And I would like, of course, to thank you for attending this uh, event. And I'm open for discussion. OK, thank you, Professor Pavlidis, for an amazing presentation. Uh, it was excellent. Uh, I am reading feedbacks from uh, the classrooms of ESO. Uh, so one last question from my side. How do you think we could approach CUP currently in a research uh, perspective in order to improve the prognosis of, of our patients? I mean, with the Japanese trial using the newest technologies in diagnosis and the newest drugs on the market regarding targeted therapies and immune checkpoint inhibitors, and the prognosis remains poor. How do you think we should advance on that? Well, first of all, diagnostically, we hope that probably liquid biopsy will help to get uh, some more information about these patients. Now, therapeutically, as I said before, we are desperately should wait for getting the results of these two big randomized studies. Probably the first one, uh, and you are already in Gustave Roussy, uh, should be uh, ready by the end of this year. This is, sure. this is my information. So um, 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 we desperately wait to get these results in order to answer correctly your question. Up to now, this is the, quest, the answers I can give to you. OK. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, we could close. Yeah, that's it. Huh? That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank Have you. Very, thank you. Take care. Thank you, Professor Pavlidis, and thank you, Dr. Rasi. Ladies and gentlemen, the session has now concluded. The next ESO session will. Да, благодарим профессора Павлидиса за сегодняшнюю лекцию. К сожалению, опять не было от вас вопросов, но мы надеемся, что вам было все достаточно понятно. И в следующий раз уже на традиционно русском языке проведенные мероприятия, и я думаю, что вопросов будет намного больше. Безусловно. И мы еще раз вам напоминаем, что следующий эссо-спот у нас состоится... И, Евгений, включай микрофон. Да, что следующий эссо-спот у нас состоится 30 апреля. Лучшая по материалам Эш, лимфома Ходжкина. Следующее заседание спот, которое уже пройдет на русском языке, у нас будет 2 апреля. А не 16, как Евгений раньше сказал. Да. И тема, как мы уже говорили, метастатический рак молочной железы, эстроген позитивный. Да, ну и, соответственно, еще раз напоминаю о том, что у нас проходит набор 
молодых специалистов, как кураторов нашего проекта «Спот» в своих регионах. Вы также можете выходить с инициативой доклада какой-то лекции, клинического случая, разбора пациентов, которых мы проведем также в прямом эфире. Плюс мы еще сейчас планируем организацию грантов, которые планируются в течение года осуществить да, со стажировкой в нашем центре. И в ближайшее время мы об этом объявим. Мы думаем, что к форуму, к нашему «Белой ночи» мы уже определим несколько победителей, которые приедут к нам примерно на две недели для стажировки на любом из отделений нашего центра. Поэтому следите за новостями. И опять же приглашаем вас традиционно на форум «Белой ночи», который пройдет с 20 по 23 июня 2019 года в гостинице «Прибалтийская» в Санкт-Петербурге. За 4 дня вас ждут лекции от ведущих специалистов в области онкологии. И, Не конечно, России, но и мира. Ну, да, и общение среди а, специалистов. Также будет организована сессия ЭСА. Европейская будет организована отдельно сессия Европейской школы онкологии, где профессор Павлитис, который сегодня прочитал нам лекцию, представит свой обзор возможности, леч... возможности обучения не только в Европе, но и в Америке. Его доклад будет называться Global Curriculum in Oncology. Каким стандартам должен соответствовать современный врач-онколог? Помимо этого пройдет отдельная сессия Европейской школы онкологии в субботу по теме опухоли желудочно-кишечного тракта. Сессия СПОТ пройдет в первый день форума, это 20 июня, во второй половине дня. Сессия будет проходить на английском языке, но с параллельным переводом. Нашими гостями на сессии спот будет Джилл Морган, это председатель э, Smayan Oncologist, Матео Ламбертини, который также является председателем Smayan Oncologist, как я уже сказала, э, профессор Павлидис. Помимо этого будут ведущие наши молодые специалисты, и э, спот пройдет под эгидой лайфхаки для молодого онколога. То есть мы поговорим не только о том, э, какими знаниями должен обладать молодой онколог, но и, в общем-то, как получить различные гранты на обучение, э, где можно пройти стажировку, и все, что нужно знать современному, молодому, развивающемуся специалисту. Да, и для молодых специалистов, ординаторов, обучающихся, э, аспирантов, участие в форуме бесплатное, поэтому подавайте заявки, подавайте свои тезисы и приезжайте на форум. Мы вас ждем. До встречи в следующий вторник. До свидания. До свидания.